Our next panel is on inequality um, in uh, power dynamics, impact on human rights and inclusive governance. And uh, so I would like uh, you to join me in welcoming uh, Graziele Costudio David, who is Regional Economic Justice Coordinator at Oxfam America Latina y el Cari Caribe. <laughs> Caribbean, <laughs> to, uh, who will introduce uh, our guest for the next panel. Hi, good morning. It's so nice to be here with you. Um, and I'm really happy to introduce you to this panel on inequality in power dynamics, impact on human rights and inclusive governance. And to have a panel with all women, it's really good to see that. Um, we are going to talk on this panel about the intersection between global tax justice, economic equality and social responsibilities with a focus on a varied international context, including case studies on Brazil care economy and on Nigerian healthcare. The session will highlight how tax policies within the existing power structures can impact social equity and fundamental rights within different socioeconomic contexts and frameworks. Also, we are going to be presenting some proposals for new tax governance structures at the national, regional, and global levels that would ensure justice and inclusive in the broader sense. This comprehensive interdisciplinary approach seeks not only to analyze the problems, but also to offer systemic solutions to rebuild trust and promote a more inclusive, fair, and accountable international tax system. With that aim, we are going to have as speakers Afton Leandre Titus, who is an associate professor at the University of Cape Town, Luisa Nassif Pires, who is an assistant professor at Universidade, um, the State University of Campinas, Madeleine Walker, an early career fellow at the Collegium Helveticum. Um, and also a permanent lecturer and assistant professor at University of Sheffield, Professor Alison Christians, um, the Heward Stickman Chair in the Law of Taxation, McGill University Faculty of Law, and Rachel Aterpoya, Senior Researcher for Tax Justice Network and a professor at University of St. Andrews. So to start, we are going to start with Madeline Walker. She's not here. The presentation is recorded and we're going to watch over there. Hello and thanks everyone for being here. I'm very sorry that I can't be with you in person, but I'm honored to be part of this important conversation and hope to be able to meet at least some of you in the future. My name is Madeline Volker and I am a historian of taxation and colonialism. Today I will present a paper that I am co-authoring with the political scientist Martin Hearson and the legal scholar Afton Titus, who is also on the panel today. Uh, the title is Towards a New International Tax Order, Empire's Shadow, Neoliberal Present, and Regionalist Future. And the aim of the paper is to reflect on the past, present, and future of global tax justice from a governance perspective. So discussion about post-neoliberalism have flourished recently in tandem with discussions about geoeconomic fragmentation at the global level. You might have heard the words reshoring, nearshoring, or onshoring. Well, the underlying idea, at least as far as global economic governance is concerned, is that we might be seeing the end of the Washington consensus. Well, is this the case? In this paper, we seek to offer some answers to this question by focusing on the global tax order, which is the topic of today's conference. We define neoliberalism as a political economic doctrine premised on a belief in market mechanisms, which implies that the state must act to create institutions to ensure their proper functioning, or indeed it must artificially create markets where they do not naturally exist. We identified three characteristics of the neoliberal global tax order. First, legal encasement of capital rights through bilateral tax treaties. 
Second, the creation of offshore spaces for, for wealth accumulation. And third, the use of a market logic to distribute taxable profits between jurisdictions, the uh, so-called arm's length principle. But our historical analysis doesn't stop here. We're also interested in showing how the historical conditions of colonialism and post-colonialism shaped the global tax order we live in today. Empire and neoliberalism are far from unrelated because as the historian Quinn Slobodin has written in his book, The Globalists, I quote, empires could end, neoliberals argued after 1945, but only if capital rights were secured and nation states were kept from impeding the free flow of money and goods, end quote. The process of gradual legal encasement of capital rights against governments, which was itself embedded in the proliferation of tax treaties, which in turn created a space conducive to tax competition, began in the 1920s. This historical process was undergirded by the decisive influence of business power, which crucially shaped path taken and not taken, as well as the location of decision making. The second characteristic of the neoliberal global tax order is its tolerance and even enabling of the emergence of the offshore world, defined by Ron and Panelon as, I quote, a set of juridical realms marked by more or less withdrawal of regulation and taxation on the part of a growing number of states, end quote. The offshore, the offshore world, sorry, has a long history, which is deeply tied to the U.S. and Europe's colonial and imperial history. As my own work shows, colonies were fertile terrain for tax havenry and were even themselves tax havens. Capital flight in the aftermath of decolonization also largely contributed to um, the expansion of tax havens, as the historian Vanessa Ogle has shown. A third characteristic of the neoliberal global tax order, the arm's length principle, finds its origins in the 1930s and emerged after the American tax lawyer Mitchell B. Carroll concluded what he called his world tax tour, during which he traveled the globe to find out how different countries and colonies were choosing to tax increasingly global companies. Most importantly, however, what really informs our reflection on the future post-neoliberal nature of the global tax order is our analysis of what neoliberal global tax governance has done to and meant for the global South, or back then the colonized and later decolonizing world. The hegemony of the OECD, a club of rich countries uh, in global tax governance, has in fact a long history that we seek to tell in the paper. This is not, we argue, a history of quiet uh, acquiescence, but a site of power struggles and contestation. There were efforts in the past to do things differently, and it is important to know this if we are to imagine another global tax order. Histories of international tax governance uh, make very little or no reference, in fact, to imperial conflicts and arrangements. This is unfortunate because it limits our understanding of the roots of inequality in global tax governance. It is here, in fact, that we begin. In the British and French empires, um, colonial territories were typically considered financially autonomous, meaning that metropolitan and global tax and colonial tax systems, sorry, evolved independently from each other. From the point of view of metropolitan tax administrations, many of these territories were considered foreign for tax purposes, but tax conflicts were deemed particularly problematic because they threatened the coherence of imperial economies. This became an important issue during the interwar period in a context of increased economic block formation. One such system was the Dominion Income Tax Relief Scheme in the British Empire, which was established in the aftermath of the First World War to provide solutions to the increasingly onerous double taxation of income in the United Kingdom and Dominion countries. It offered a credit against UK tax uh, for tax paid in the colonies and dominions, but only up to half the value of the UK tax while, while placing on dominions an obligation to reciprocate. Archival research shows that conflicts between London and Australia or Canada, for instance, were frequent. 
so-called crown colonies were often treated even more disparagingly by the central administration in London, and their specific circumstances were hardly considered. Conflicts over taxing rights were arguably much more bitter in the French colonial empire, where capital importing colonial territories, firms, and the metropole engaged in protracted legal conflict. Um, and this is something I look at in a forthcoming article. There were conflicts as well at the League of Nations where Latin American countries, Argentina, for instance, tried in vain to advocate for more consideration of source or capital importing uh, countries. By the 1940s, with Europe at war, Latin American nations again had an opening. The Technical Committee of the League had moved to Princeton with the financial support of the Rockefeller Foundation, and it produced the Mexico Model Convention uh, in 1943, which gave capital important countries the primary right of taxation over almost all forms of income. But this opening closed again after the end of the war, war and this was followed by what historians have called the UN interlude, when the UN served as the principal organ of global tax governance. Um, and the legal scholar Niki Teo has a book on this, which I recommend. In the 50s and 60s, the onset of the Cold War and decolonization progressively entrenched the role of what would become the OECD in 1961 uh, as the de facto custodian of Western and high income countries' taxing rights. The history of the OECD's broader interaction with the global South is enlightening in this regard. As argued by the historian Matthias Schmelzer, I quote, the OECD began to behave like a selfish club of the haves from which the have-nots were excluded, end quote. And it did so especially after the shock of the 1964 UNCTAD conference, which gave newly decolonized countries a voice on the international stage. The aim was thus, I would argue, from the very beginning to counter the supposed threat posed by the decolonizing world, which means that um, exclusivity was somewhat baked into the global tax order as it emerged during the second half of the 20th century. So the paper contains other historical insights and examples of roads not traveled. Um, it also suggests ways forward, notably through a stronger tax regionalism, but Afton will tell you more about this. Um, to conclude, I would say that uh, I am an academic historian, not a policymaker, but my role here has been to remind our audience that international tax uh, or global taxation has never only been a technical matter, but always also a site of power struggles, and that its history shows um, that it still hasn't come to terms with the colonial and post-colonial settings in which it emerged. All right, so I think I managed to stick to the 710 minute limit. I thank you for your attention and I wish you a productive conference. Thank you. Well, it was really good to hear what Madeline had to say about how the global tax, um, tax issue, it's not just about a technical matter, but a power struggle, and now we're going to hear Professor Alexon Christian with a paper on um, a working party on governance. Thank you. How's that? Can you hear me okay? Great. Hi. Um, yeah, okay. So obviously we're going to talk about governance on this panel. I actually sort of had hoped you would go before me because you uh, bridge between me and Madeline, but we're going to do it this way and it's going to, it's going to work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so Afton and I are constantly thinking about governance and others in the room have been thinking about governance and I've been talking about this way too long, uh, 20 years now talking about governance. And, uh, so this is pretty simple, right? This is a power struggle, as what, as Madeline said, and it's a power struggle because it's a resource struggle. This is obviously about resource distribution. That's what international tax is mediating. That's what it's doing. And anybody who doesn't want to talk about redistribution and just wants to talk about technical rules is lying to you. That's not what this field is about. It's about distribution. We've always known that. 
And because resources are limited and having power over resources is fun and nice and good and everybody wants to have it, we're not going to actually talk about uh, the way that we get power or hold it. We're going to talk about scientific uh, rules, you know, scientific uh, committees. And you'll see, you want to talk about policy competition, you will see the same words being used across the institutions and around the world to talk about tax. So I'm here to say this. You all know this. I'm speaking to the choir in a way here. When we talk about tax, yeah, of course there's policy. Policy is blah, blah, blah. It doesn't mean anything until it's in the law. And then it doesn't mean anything until it's implemented. So there's policy. Then there's plumbing. Plumbing is what we're doing now in pillar one, pillar two. Somebody already made the policy, now we're doing the plumbing. And you all know that the world is full of people who are paid to either slow down the plumbing, make sure it doesn't work, or uh, make it work to their own advantage. So there's policy and then there's plumbing. And you know what? We're here to talk about neither one of those. We're here to talk about the process. How are we getting to the policy? How are we getting to the plumbing? Because the process has been broken forever as we've already heard many times already today. And why is that? Because it works for the people who set it up. That's why it's broken and it's gonna remain broken because it works for the people that it works for. Uh, so what are we supposed to do about that? So th this is not controversial to anyone in this room to say thinking about governance is actually really tough because when you're talking about process, you're also talking about policy and you're also talking about plumbing, but now about the processes of decision making. And which of us is really good and knows a lot about how to decide who should decide and how they should decide? Which of us tax lawyers have spent time thinking about who should decide and how should they decide things? That's not what we've been taught to think about. We've been taught to think about, uh, you know, rules and whether arm's length is real or not. Uh, and, you know, what to do with a separate entity and what to do when the tax system is an accessory to the commercial or corporate law system. We have problems that have nothing to do with who decides and how do they decide. And we have not spent any time spending our time learning about governance. So of course we're struggling because this is not our area of expertise. And for people whose area of expertise it is, they don't really want to talk about tax, do they? Because they've been taught that tax is scientific and it's plumbing. So we are in the crossroads here where we're trying to figure out how to talk about governance in a rational, coherent way. And that's not what governance is. It's not rational or coherent, it's about power. So, uh, you know, my own view of this is now I'm gonna turn you against me, okay? So many of you may have read over the years my critiques of the OECD. I hope that will serve me here that many of you know that I am not here in any way carrying water for the processes of the OECD. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm banned there. Um, so hopefully that will help me when I say the thing I'm about to say. <laughs> uh, I think we alluded this morning, it was an allusion to the uh, inclusive framework. You all know how that happened. It happened because countries that are not members of the OECD said, we should not be doing process at the OECD, we should be doing it at the UN, and so the OECD made a UN. Made its own UN, without any charter, and without any mandate, and without any processes, and without any transparency about how it was making that decision, and without any admission that the policy had already been set, and this was about the plumbing, right? And so, of course, we're frustrated. The OECD is really good at some things, though, aren't they? Actually, that's why we're so frustrated with them. It's because they're really good. They're very effective. They're fast. They're efficient in their way. They have the working parties. They have the secretariat. They have the meetings here in Paris. They have, you know, the campus. They have the staff. They have the expertise. They have the know-how. They have processes and institutions that are working, have been working for many years on our topic, tax. So of course they're very good at it. So here, here's where I turn you against me. I say, okay, we need to take tax governance seriously, as seriously as we take 
working party one, two, three, four, five on various plumbing issues, treaties, and so on. We need to take tax governance seriously. And that means we should already have a working party on tax governance. Where is it? Why, what are we waiting for? Why have we never, ever studied this? Why do we not take this seriously when we're always fighting about this and we're always discussing this? And we have statement after statement about uh, the PCOT. What, what was that thing? The, the coherent, you know, the, I, the OECD, the IMF, the World Bank, and the UN were all going to work together in peace and harmony. Yeah, the platform for collaboration on tax, remember that? So where is the working party on governance? Where is it? Why doesn't it exist? I don't understand. Well, of course, I do understand. We all understand. So why, uh, why can't we get it? Because we're tr trying to build policy uh, competition, which I don't disagree with. I agree with that. I don't think things should be done at the OECD any more than anyone in this room does. But the working party on governance probably should start at the OECD. Now you can be mad at me. Okay, so why am I saying this? Partially, it's just to see what you say and respond to me and tell me that I'm wrong. I'm really used to people telling me I'm wrong, so it's not going to hurt my feelings. Tell me why I'm wrong. But here's why I might be right. We should already have a working party on governance. We should be taking it seriously. The member countries of the OECD pride themselves on their governance when it comes to their domestic systems. They spend a lot of time thinking about it and they have a lot of expertise and a lot of people who write a lot of papers and books about governance. So there's nothing missing in terms of their own governance structures. They ought to be able to replicate their own studies on governance. Uh, they can convene a working party tomorrow, today even. It's not too late. They could convene the working party today. And everybody's already got plans to come here to Paris to have meetings on various things about tax. So they can just fit it into the schedule that they already have. The, uh, the institution is in place. The people are in place. The expertise is easily marshaled. And there's a, such pressure on this institution now that how could they do anything but take it seriously if they set it up themselves? <laughs> So why don't we do this? Why don't we have a, ta a working party in governance? And why don't we have it at the OECD? Well, because you will tell me, and I think rightfully, you will tell me, well, we can't have a working party on governance at the OECD because they're the problem. They're the problem of governance. Well, actually, they're not. It's their member countries that are the problem of governance. And those same member countries are in the uh, UN. And those same member countries are in the IMF and the World Bank. So it doesn't actually mm, matter too much where those countries dominate the discussion, in my view. Who cares where they dominate the discussion? They're going to dominate the discussion. That's not a shock, I don't think. But it, what matters is that we have to uh, put some pressure on the basic framework of governance. Who is deciding who decides? How are they deciding who decides? And having people who think about governance a lot study that topic and having them do it as part of the regular workflow that's already still taking place in the OECD is I think at least I would suggest a way to push forward. Now I hope, I expect some pushback. I want you to tell me why it is better for us to wait. It is better for us to wait another year and a half till there's a framework convention at the UN and then hope that the UN will see governance as an issue to think about going forward. It is better to wait until we have an institution that is outside of the OECD and then invite those OECD members to come in on an equal footing with everyone else uh, as they have done in the past. I hope that you can tell me why that's better. So far, my feeling is this is so urgent, so long time in coming that uh, you know I'm willing to accept what the thing that I cannot change, which is that the OECD is controlling the narrative today, and they will continue to control it until. And I don't know when the until is, and I don't know how many more years I have left to stand up here and harangue the world about stuff nobody will listen to me and won't change uh, because, you know, it's just too controversial or whatever. So that's where I stop right there with my two-minute warning. Hopefully I have given you enough for you to be upset, but also, uh, you know, maybe think of some creative, innovative ways to start talking about governance and making it the central idea. Thank you.
Wow. Thank you, Professor Allison, for making a very provocative case for the working party on, on tax governance. And I'm sure that we're going to have a strong discussion about where to have it. And now I pass it on to Afton Leandro Titus, who is going to talk about global tax justice, envisioning a political justice framework for international taxation. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Afton Titus. I've been debating whether or not I should correct that. It's just, uh, it's one of those things. Uh, the pronunciation is fine otherwise. <laughs> um, with this paper, what I'm proposing is a new governance structure within the African Union to address the current political injustices in global governance at the moment. So when I talk about political justice, what I mean is the process and institutions that allow for rules and standards to be made. What I suggest is an integration of the regional economic communities in Africa together with the African Tax Administration Forum to form a common African position on political tax and international tax issues. With this, I envisage that this structure that I propose would empower developing countries to influence international tax standards and policies by forming their own international tax fora. How would we do this? Well, to start off with, I think we would understand where we come from and where we are going, and also what the position is at the moment. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I understand, I think everyone knows this. Fundamentally, our current international tax governance system is characterized by deep inequality this stems mainly from the exclusion of developing countries from agenda setting and decision making, which then results in international standards that are in fact far from it. So this has increased the calls for change to have global coordination and cooperation in the true sense. This is especially true in Africa. Since 2019, the African Tax Administration Forum has been calling for African countries to come together to form their own international tax policy body. This could work together with other institutions like the African Union, the regional economic communities that are part of it, and other interested bodies. This was followed up in 2020 by the fourth high-level tax policy dialogue, an event um, an event where about 48 African countries, members of parliament, civil society and central banks came together and there was a unified call to have a continental platform created for African countries to come together to talk about international tax policy issues. Since then, we've seen a promising movement towards this. In 2023, we've had the African Tax Administration Forum and the AU Commission come together to form a memorandum of understanding with the idea that together they would work to make the African voice more influential in global tax policy making. All of this is added impetus by the fact that the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement is now coming into force. This agreement is basically a flagship project by the AU to eventually form a continental common market across Africa. So at some stage, tax will need to be discussed, and that's where my paper comes in. This is an answer to those calls. Fundamentally, I am proposing that the 54 African countries be divided according to the existing regional economic communities. At this level, they would discuss international tax policy issues that are important to them. They would set their own agenda they would develop their own solutions and they would implement it themselves. At this stage, I also envisage that the African Tax Administration Forum would support this process as they are doing now. The purpose of ATAF at this level also is to check for any technical tax conflicts which may occur at this level to make sure that when it is eventually produced at the AU level, that there are no technical tax conflicts, because these would already have been addressed at the grassroots level. 
once these policies have been finalized at the regional economic community level, they are then presented at the AU assembly level, where all African countries are members, for discussion and coordination to make sure that these policies need not be the same, but that they work together. Also, this process of bringing in the African Union at this stage allows for tax policies to be discussed broadly with other economic strategies, for example, trade and development policies. This structure is also useful in instances where you would like other institutions to allow their input to be put on the table. And here you could also allow at the AU level for other institutions like the African Development Bank, for instance, or civil society to provide their expertise in the discussion at the AU level. This proposal is also useful when what you require is a united continental response to international tax policy proposals, such as the OECD's two-pillar proposal to the taxation of the digital economy. What I have here is that the regional economic communities themselves would study the proposals and would then provide effective um, studies on what the proposals would actually mean for the member countries themselves and also for the region or the community as well. Once they understand this, they would then be able to provide their position to the AU and the AU would then be able, to, once those positions have been decided across the continent, it would be able to protect those interests, as is the AU mandate to protect the interests of the African people. Having said that, I'm not completely naive. I know that it may be difficult for some countries to give up their tax sovereignty to the African Union, even though they've created it themselves. So it is possible even for the regional economic communities to go to the International Tax Forum and then to present a united front at that level. What I envisage ultimately is for the African Union to be able to negotiate at an International Tax Forum as an African regional bloc. This may either happen at the OECD or maybe even at the United Nations should a tax platform be created there. With this proposal, I see a number of advantages. So first is that developing countries would be able to set their own agenda in terms of international tax policy making. I have in mind that now that you're dealing with smaller groups, it may be easier to find common interests, common ground, and to move decisions forward then. I also see it as a possible countermeasure to national pressures. It may be possible that national policy makers may be able to reject national pressures to not follow particular policies because of the fear of the negativity that would come across the negative press, because now it's become transparent that one country is not prepared to implement regionally positive policies. A structure like this would also allow for regions to compete on the basis of regional strengths and not individual strengths alone. And it would allow for tax policies to be designed together with other economic policies, such as trade and development, for instance. From an international political justice perspective, what this proposal allows is international tax standards to be that in reality. It allows for more voices to be included in the process when creating international tax policies. And with this, what you will find is that you will have international global policies that are produced by legitimate institutions. For the future, the United Tax Convention that is on the table is a promising step forward and perhaps we can look forward to a future of global tax institutions that will be more inclusive. It has been admirable watching the work of the Africa Group and it's perhaps given us some scope to imagine that we could have international tax fora on every continent, that perhaps it would then be organized and coordinated at the UN level. I hope that the recent developments in inter international tax means that we can look forward to more inclusivity as international tax policies are made. Thank you. Well, thank you for showing us the, the case on how to think about the process on the regional level.
and for sure this proposal for the African countries is very relevant for the Latin American tax platform too, and maybe how to think the dialogue between them. And now I would like to pass it on to Professor Luisa, who is going to talk about tax reforms for the provision of care in Brazil, public investment or tax incentives. Hi everyone, uh, good morning, thank you so much to the organizers, it's been great so far. So I am actually going to spend more time today on the motivations of this work than the results itself. Uh, the results are pretty obvious. Uh, we started this work to discuss if public investment or tax incentives to the provision of care would be, uh, which of those two models would be better in terms of inequality and the people that are, uh, that are benefiting uh, from those. And obviously, uh, we know that tax incentives are not great. So why do I spend time even doing things that are obvious? Because we live in a world where evidence-based things are important and there is a political role in, in explaining those and putting those in figures and Brazil is so unequal that actually it's easy to make figures that are shocking enough and that will lead public opinion uh, to understand certain things so so my motivation uh, as I just mentioned uh, has a lot to do with trying to to estimate what is the social cost of a political preference that you actually observe. So in Brazil, we have been observing over time a political preference for tax deductions and not for increasing uh, the provision of health services and uh, care services in general. Uh, I will skip on the methodology very quickly and then look into the results after. So first, I want to give you some Brazilian fiscal context. Uh, some of you might know, but in 2016, our president-elected was impeached due to a fiscal witch hunt, basically. She was found guilty of fiscal crimes. Uh, and after that, right after that, a few months after, they passed a fiscal rule in Brazil that basically froze all, all, uh, ex uh, all government expenditures for 20 years. This fiscal rule had been in place until uh, very recently when it was actually uh, uh, changed to a new, what they're calling a new fiscal framework, which is still a very restrictive fiscal rule. Basically, before we had uh, a strict roof for spending, now we have a moving roof, but still very focused on surpluses. Uh, which means that to increase expenditure in this moment, we need to do a tax reform that increases uh, the, the amount that the government is receiving. Uh, and this also, there is some details of the new fiscal rule that also makes it easier for a deduction. So tax, uh, tax expenditure is not seen as expenditure in the same way that other kinds of expenditure. So investing in care, for example, is much harder politically because of the rule and because of the Congress than actually investing, uh, uh, sorry, than deducing uh, ex uh, the care expenditures in uh, the, the, our, meu Deus, impostos de renda. Income tax, thank you, I'm sorry. So besides the new fiscal framework, we also have an observation of the political preferences of our, government, of our uh, Congress. So between 89 and 2020, 67.2% of tax reforms that were presented to Congress created an expenditure deduction, an exemption, or a special regime. That's a very high percentage. We also observe, looking into a narrative database that we built, that uh, tax, the justifications for tax reforms that are most common are first that it will allow for growth, the second is modernization, and only 15% of them is because of tax justice. So this is important because the way we are framing what we're fighting for actually matters. So I don't come to my, uh, to my minister of finance and tell him, please invest in care because of social justice. I tell him, please invest in care because it's gonna create jobs, it's gonna create growth, and so on. And that also matters for how we're framing our tax reforms, unfortunately. Uh, regarding, uh, I guess I already went a little bit through this political context, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the provision of care in Brazil. 
what we have, uh, what we have right now is just a pulverized amount of care services that are part of our universal health system and our universal uh, education system. We don't have a care system in Brazil implemented. We have a new secretariat within our Ministry of Development that is just uh, uh, that is now creating a policy, a care policy for Brazil. They do not have the budget to create a system in itself, but they are important. They are overviewing all of those services and thinking of how to increase access to care services in Brazil. At the same time, we have 13 million women in Brazil that are out of the labor force just because of care responsibilities. Uh, and that, on top of that, obviously we have a lot of women that are going to be part-time or they're overburdened and they're suffering from time poverty. Uh, so the provision in care in Brazil, besides being pulverized, it's also very dependent on informal networks and dependent on unpaid labor and on precarious jobs. So 18% of black women that are occupied in Brazil are domestic workers. Their average salary is below minimum wage and their tax, uh, their, uh, the rate of informality of them is above 70% when the rest of informality rate in Brazil, the overall informality rate is around 35%, so it's twice uh, as high. So there is a care crisis in Brazil, as we have in other places in the world, and it's being solved not by the government provision of care, it's actually being based on two very strong pillars of our, of our society, which is racism and sexism. And this matters as well to understand and to name those because we've been talking here how we are politically fighting against colonialism, but we're also politically fighting with our tax, uh, with our tax reforms to fight against racism and patriarchy. And that's extremely hard, exactly because who are the people that are making the rules, that are passing those rules? So if we look into the Congress, to Brazilian Congress, it is exactly the people benefiting from those systems that are responsible for making those reforms. So without having, uh, without actually having support of public opinion, it's extremely hard to push forward. So this is, why we're doing this type of work uh, at MAGI, this research center where I work at. So the methodology we first, uh, we use the expenditure, uh, the expenditure survey, and uh, we use the very well-known uh, distributional national accounts methodology that is very at the heart of this house actually, uh, to, to, uh, to, make the expenditure survey better at the top using uh, our uh, tax data. We don't have that much tax data, but uh, we have some. Then we do a calculation on that expenditure survey of the tax deduction and compare that uh, with, uh, in the case of having an expenditure on health services, what would be, uh, what would be the benefit, sorry, education services. So basically we take, uh, we take all of the people that pay taxes and we simulate if we gave them the ability of deducting all of their care uh, expenditures on education uh, from their uh, income tax, we take that amount and then we simulate the same thing uh, at the bottom of the distribution, uh, which is who mostly use our education services. And we compare how those two things would be distributed. Uh, and then finally, we do an input output model to find the job creation of each of those two different, uh, different uh, simulations. So the first thing we find is that there is a caveat on the methodology so far. So for example, tax deductions on health less, uh, in 2020 were 20 billion. What we find when we're just looking into the tax uh, and the expenditure survey is an amount of 480 million reais only. Uh, and it's extremely hard to get tax expenditure from those surveys. So that is the part of we're not yet where we want to be with the simulation, but we still observe that there would be a significant impact on inequality if we do tax deductions for care versus public care services in the Gini, for example, even though the, small, uh, the amount is extremely small here. 
and the share of the people that are actually benefiting, it's mostly black people versus white people that would benefit from public care services, and it would be mostly white people benefiting from tax deductions for care. Same with men and women, we see more men uh, benefiting from the tax deductions uh, and more women benefiting from public care surveys. And when we look into the share, uh, the, the, the distribution by income, uh, by the deciles, we see that only the top, because only 13%, the 13% of the top of, of Brazil pay uh, income tax. That's the only uh, part of our uh, population that are above the minimum bracket. So it's a very, uh, it's a very privileged group of people already, uh, which means that tax deductions will only benefit that group of people. And most of the public care services uh, benefit uh, the bottom of our distribution. And uh, the labels are switched here. The, the amounts are correct, but the labels are switched. So uh, just, I'm sorry about that. And then the jobs created. So this is the input output model. What we see is if we are spending in public education or spending on public health, and we do those simulations because we actually have a public system of health and education, so those exist in our input output, while our care system does not exist in our input output. So this is as a reference, as a proxy for what it would be for a care service. Uh, so basically we have a very uh, equal distribution of jobs if expenditure is on public education. We would have mostly women benefiting from uh, public health, 54% of them, again, this is switched. Uh, and the tax deduction for care would actually create 58% of its jobs to men and only 42% for women because the only jobs that would be created with that is through an income uh, multiplier and not actual jobs directly created. And all of those uh, actually take into account direct, indirect, and induced effects. So the multiplier effect is being calculated with all of them. And then finally, uh, we also look into the simulation. And actually, all groups benefit more from expenditure in public education and public health in terms of jobs created. Even white men that benefit relatively more uh, in tax deduction for care, but relatively less compared to white women when it's expenditure in public education and public health. So this also tells us that even though uh, if we are to implement uh, a tax, uh, a uh, sorry, a care system in Brazil, the jobs that we will create will still be extremely wide. So we need to couple that with other types of policies and really take into account the role that domestic uh, paid workers have been having in Brazil through a very precarized uh, type of jobs. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for showing how the decision on tax policy can not only reduce income inequality, but also gender and race inequalities. And now we're going to listen to Rachel um, speaking about European tax havens and fundamental rights in Nigeria. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about European tax havens and fundamental rights in Nigeria. So sorry, it doesn't look like the animation is working. But um, so our collective rights are guaranteed by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And our uh, fundamental rights are the physiological rights that we need to thrive and survive. So the right to education, the right to good health care, the right to clean water and, and basic sanitation, which I hazard, I guess, most of us take for granted in this room. And um, for rights to be respected, they need to be protected. And Article 28 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, says that everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which these rights can be realized. The Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals are grounded in these human rights. And if we consider the right to education, so Sustainable Development Goal number four, um, we can see that there's a serious gap. 200, over 250 million children are still out of school today. And of course, the coverage of this right is not equal. In Europe, it almost 100% of children are able to attend upper secondary school. In lower income countries, this is less than half. So what is needed for fundamental rights? And I guess we are all in 
agreement on this. You need government re revenue in well-governed countries. And of course, the nation is responsible for this, the country, but they the international tax rules that we heard presented earlier have such a profound impact on government revenue. And existing rules, um, and as we saw earlier, has not had a discernible impact on corporate profit shifting. So in the paper, we set out to consider the impact of profit shifting on fundamental rights. And if everyone has the right to an enabling international order, we do this by looking at the impact of profit shifting on Nigerian government revenue and fundamental rights. And equally, what do European countries gain from being tax havens in terms of government revenue and fundamental <coughs> rights? So we chose Nigeria, Africa's most populous nation, because it was one of two African countries that is part of the inclusive framework that did not sign the outcome statement of the OECD G20 BEPS um, two-pillar solution for taxing the digital economy. It's also led the charge in the Africa group at the United Nations for international tax cooperation. And in the data set that we use, which has also found its home in, the, in PSC from Torslov and colleagues and available on the Missing Profits website, is one of two African countries that is included. And as you can see here, Nigeria loses 26% of its corporate tax revenue because of these tax havens. And we can see which tax havens are responsible, both in terms of profits lost as well as tax revenue lost. The data set also includes what European tax havens gain in terms of profit shifted inward and at what rate they tax these profits. But what does this mean? We talk about numbers, we've heard numbers earlier, and as a team at the University of St. Andrews and the University of Leicester, we look at, we model the relationship between governance, government revenue, and fundamental rights. So what do these figures translate into impact on people? And using um, economic metric modeling of over 40 years, we can look at the relationship and of course, impact of increases in government revenue or changes in government revenue take a long time to have an impact on fundamental rights and governance. And through this, we can predict the scale of how many more people will access their fundamental rights. How many more children will be able to sit in school as a result of not having profits sh shifted out of the country? And of course, the relationship between government revenue and the coverage of fundamental rights is not linear. It's represented best by the S-shaped curve, which you're familiar with from other aspects of social and economic development. So at low initial government revenue per capita, you don't see much shift in uh, coverage of fundamental rights. But quite quickly, and in most lower income countries, just a small amount of government revenue can have a profound impact for children and people accessing their rights. And this plateaus off when you are in countries that almost have 100% coverage, where almost every child can go to school where almost everyone has access to clean drinking water, so in most of the European Union. And governance, of course, affects the shape in every country individually of the S-shaped curve. And increases in government revenue per capita also have a profound impact across different governance indicators, which essentially means that um, increases in government revenue in well-governed gov countries will have much more effect. So what do we find? For Nigeria, 3% of government revenue goes to tax havens and a quarter of this to EU tax havens and more if you consider other European countries like Switzerland. So if Nigeria had additional revenue equivalent to all losses, 400,000 additional Nigerians would have the right to drink clean water. 600,000 would have their right to use basic sanitation. 142,000 children would sit in school every single day and 10 additional children would survive every day. So that's over 3,600 3, children surviving every single year if profits were not shifted out of Nigeria and there would be improvements in governance. Let's look what happens in the European Union or in Europe as a result of profits being shifted inwards. So just considering profits being shifted inwards from Nigeria, there's only 0.01% of revenue gains in European tax havens from attracting these profits. And because fundamental rights coverage is almost 100%, this results in just 400 people with access to safe sanitation and five additional children with a right to education. Here you can see in the Netherlands, it has absolutely no impact on primary school attendance. <coughs> and if we consider just two countries that are available in the data set, looking at the impact of profits being shifted inwards to the Netherlands, which is the takes the greatest share of um, profits that are shifted out of Ni Nigeria, as a result, if this changed, 23,000 additional children in Nigeria would be at school. And the cost of this would be the right to education for just two Dutch children. 
So does everyone have their right to an enabling international order where fundamental rights can be realized? As we heard earlier from Tove and Derage, high, higher income countries lose more in absolute terms. However, lower income countries are losing much more in terms of impact. And this is why OECD and BEPS rule changes over the last years have not had uh, and not been effective and not been inclusive. And this is why the Africa group, as you're so familiar with, came to, went to the United Nations and put forward a tax resolution for international tax cooperation at the UN. 125 countries voted in favor of this. Every single EU member country voted against it, as we already heard earlier. This is despite the fact that the EU's very foundations are built on contributing to the sustainable development and protecting human rights, particularly the rights of children, not just here within the EU, but outside across the world. And these extraterritorial obligations have been repeatedly recognized by UN committees on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, um, the Committee on the Rights of Child, and many people in here have made significant contributions to this at the national level and at the UN calling on these countries, on Switzerland, on the United Kingdom, on Netherlands and Ireland to look at their domestic tax policy and the impact on cross-border tax abuse and on the fundamental rights of citizens in other countries. And this year we saw for the first time a European human rights um, body also making a submission and calling on its very own government to look at this as well. As we heard from Gabriel Zuckman earlier, this is, this is not a natural law. Fun, undermin, undermining fundamental rights is not inevitable. There can be huge impacts for fundamental rights of citizens in many countries in this world if we change this. As things stand, we are choosing to prefer the rights of two children to education in the Netherlands over the right to education of 23,000 Nigerians. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for making such a strong case to end tax abuse and to ensure rights. Um, we are going to have um, some minutes for some follow-up questions and then open the floor for questions and answer from, from everyone. I would like to, um, to start asking Alison, this discussion around uh, uh, a working group on global tax governance and the proposal that the OECD could convene such, such a working group could raise questions about the role and neutrality of an organization such as the, the OECD. In light of the development of the global tax policy agenda in the recent decade, what are your thoughts on the ideal placement and, well, you said the OECD, but the, the focus of this um, working group to ensure fair and effective global tax governance? I should, I should turn. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't think the OECD is an ideal place for anything. So just to be clear, um, it's not what is ideal. I think what is ideal is uh, to understand what good governance actually requires and then set up the institutions and the processes to keep working towards that. We're never finished with that project, right? Like no government is done, finished, and never has to think about minoritarian bias or majoritarian bias. No government is done and finished and doesn't no, no longer has to think about how to make sure people who are marginalized are heard. Everyone is always involved in that project. So it's not a, not a question of like, now we're gonna do this and then it's gonna be done. It's more a process has to be started. And I think um, it could be part of, I think it absolutely should be part of, the framework convention, the UN framework convention, to have discussions about what are the processes that we're adopting? How are we making decisions? And how are we, when we talk about participation, when we talk about um, inclusivity, what does it actually mean in practice? What is the plumbing of those things? In the same way, when we talk about transfer pricing, we have the policy, the idea, blah, blah, and then we talk about, well, and how do we make that happen? We're never finished with that. We're just having an ongoing conversation. And what I'm suggesting um, is that 
if we refuse to have a conversation about governance, then we will always have this competition going on and because we have to come to terms with our own willingness to make decisions that create this outcome. We're willing to, we're accepting a process where that is the outcome. So as long as we are focused only on the outcome and saying that's bad outcome, we don't want that outcome. My feeling is we, if we can back up and talk about what process led us to get to that outcome that everyone is apparently comfortable with, that no one is comfortable with. That's where I'm going. And it's not about ideal. It's not about, there is no ideal. There's no ideal. There's only what we have available to us. Um, and I think it's a matter of urgency. That's why I'm pushing uh, for a working party for right now. Thank you. And for Afton, um, the concept of quality governance has been identified as critical for the effective use of increased tax revenues in improving human rights outcomes. In your view, what practical steps could countries take to enhance governance equality alongside raising tax revenues? Um, thank you for the question. I think that the immediate thing that countries could do is to work with the institutions that already exist. So one of the uh, thought processes behind the, process, the proposal that I've made is to work within whatever is in the African continent at the moment. We have an established institution called the African Union that is meant to protect African interests. We have regional economic communities that are doing excellent work in making sure that regional decisions are being carried forward, forward to improve the lives of the people in the region. I also think that immediately countries can come to the understanding that it's, as someone said earlier, that it's not necessary for everything to happen in a coordinated manner. Sometimes it's possible to solve solutions unilaterally and then together to move forward, understanding that this is a country's position and perhaps from that vantage point, working together to find others who have similar propositions. Thank you. Um, Louisa, considering the diversity of, in governance and the tax systems across different regions, how can international policy solutions be tailored to address the unique challenges faced by individual countries, particularly in terms of human rights, such as care and sustainable development? Well, that's a huge question. Uh, I think, I mean, taking the case of Brazil as a, as, as a very uh, special one. So Brazil doesn't have a, a debt problem, but Brazil has an austerity problem, which is surprising. We don't need to be imposing, we're self-imposing this type of rules. And we look into Argentina, for example, their problem is, the IMF, it, their problem is bigger in a way, it's not in their hands, but still, this course matters. So the way that we've been over and over saying that austerity is good, that this is important, this got in the heads of people all around the world. And uh, unless we make a huge case of deconstructing that, and I know research has done that already, the specialists that once were defending austerity are, have backed down, but it's still there. It's still in policy, in place. So I think this is something that we could work on to deconstruct. Thank you. And Rachel, Reflections on recent papers and proposals suggest a need for more equitable tax solutions and governance reforms. In your view, how can the international community, including an organization such as Tax Justice Network, contribute to creating a more inclusive and fair global tax system? Thank you. I mean, that's the reason we're here, right? And we heard the history of the Global Alliance for Tax Justice this morning, and that's been the raison d'etre, I think, um, and particularly individuals within that for the last for last years of bringing together. And I think that's what Afton was now speaking to. Where are we gathering momentum in the regional blocks, not just at civil society, but at government level? And we're seeing that brilliantly, I think, in Latin America. And that's like all our call in our different... I guess different callings or country representations that we make or to, to continue that and to join together. I think that's what's brilliant to have this space and to convene and discuss that. Thank you. Well, and now we're going to open for questions and answer. Who would like to make a question? There is Andres over there, so there, Martin here. We're going with these three. Well, I'm glad that I know the three of you. <laughs> um, we're going, uh, Andresa. 
we're going with these three first, Andresa, Saul, and Martin. And we're going to get the questions and then and then we come back to you, Marcelo. <laughs> Hello, all of you. I'm Andresa Pelanda from Brazilian Campaign for the Right to Education. And I'm also from Latin America Campaign for the Right to Education. And we have been doing uh, Latin America some um, exchanges and work in tax justice and everything for education and in Brazil too. So I'm really glad to see this uh, women table with all those uh, discussions on uh, regarding facing inequalities and everything. And I'm here representing also SETA project, which is a huge Brazilian uh, coalition against racism in education. And we are discussing all gender and racism issues on economics and education and everything. So I would like to hear a little bit on... Um, uh, beyond Brazilian discussions, what Latin American uh, discussions have to contribute on these uh, issues. And also, if you think that uh, we could have... Uh, how is this keen for us to get uh, anti-racist and uh, gender issues on this convention about uh, tax justice? Thank you. Yes, I'm Sol Pichotto. Just a few comments in response to Alison. Uh, I mean, you're quite right. The OECD has uh, created a de facto, tried to create a de facto international organization. They've created five global forums since 2002. Uh, now, why is this? And it is because they've created themselves as apparently the place where you set global standards on tax. Now, but if we need to go back further in history, as I think uh, Tova mentioned this morning, 1945, the intention was for the United Nations to have a commission on tax. That failed for political reasons, and the OECD set up its Committee on Fiscal Affairs, and they developed standards on international tax, on tax treaty standard. And then the UN did set up its own little committee. But the UN committee largely shadowed the OECD. They tried to modify the OECD standards on international tax. And it's since 2002, the OECD has been more aggressive in pushing its own standards. And not only have they set up these forums, but they've increased their membership to include Colombia, Chile, Mexico. And each time, they had to accept the OECD views about tax. Uh, they now have other countries that are their global partners, so the BRICS countries. And they've all joined these frameworks, inclusive frameworks, and so on. But what's interesting now is that these countries are saying, we're not happy with that. Because all of that happened at the same time that those OECD global standards were proved increasingly harmful. So that's the weird situation. The situation we're now in is that all those countries that have become partners and members of these forums have voted for a new approach. And I think you're wrong to say the OECD are now that going to be the dominant. The dominant are going to be those countries who have joined all these forums, but are now saying, no, we want something else. If they then start to create something else, the OECD reverts to being back in a, a member of its a club, as Derrige said. So that's why the OECD is not a good place to develop standards, because their standards have actually been bad. Hello, my name is Martin and I'm from Oxfam and uh, last month I was uh, privileged to be in Ghana and speak about tax with many colleagues from uh, across Africa and uh, uh, Afton's uh, presentation reminded me of one of the ideas that came up which is the possibility of using this global moment and momentum to say to regional uh, unions and uh, collaborations to governments there Practice what you preach. You could, for instance, in the East African Union, go ahead and agree on minimum uh, corporate tax rates, on minimum transparency rules, on a 
united front towards uh, double taxation agreements and the like. Uh, and I'm curious to hear uh, the risk and opportunities you see of uh, of also using the global process for uh, sub uh, regional and regional uh, uh, advocacy. Thanks. Just let's get Marcelo question because he wanted to do at the first panel and he didn't get so let's just <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, it's Marcelo from uh, Tax Justice uh, Network from the podcast. Ah, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Marcelo from Tax Justice Network and the podcast Justicia Positiva in Spanish. Um, first, brilliant panel, absolutely enjoyed it. It's really uh, great. Then, question for the most, uh, I would say, controversial American so far on the floor. <laughs> Oh, you said Canadian. You know, well, my, you know, my here. <laughs> okay. North American. North American. It's better if you think I'm American. Do you think, I mean, having said what you said, uh, do you think that basically the UN tax convention is doomed? That's one question. And the other question, I mean, I would like to ask questions to everyone, but you know, I think with two questions is enough. Uh, for the African one, uh, sorry about the names, I'm getting worse and worse about the names, uh, but um, you, if it was not for the African group, I don't think we would have got here. Um, so first is, how did you get there? Uh, given particularly that we in Latin America, we have failed completely to do it, despite all the great efforts that have been done by Colombia, mainly led by Colombia. Now Brazil is kind of you know pushing its weight, but then appears Javier Millet in Argentina and kind of disrupts <laughs> everything. So how did you really get there to have this unified position? But from what you, what you said as well, there is a distance, a gap between that unified position and all the other things that seems to be needed. Let's start from Rachel and then come this way, answering the questions that you feel like you should answer. Yeah, okay, uh, I'll, I'll actually address Andres's question. Uh, I, so, there was uh, a huge effort from Colombia last year, most of you know. We were in Bogota and then in Cartagena discussing uh, taxation from Global South perspective, from Latin America perspective. And out of that uh, came a group of women that uh, feminist economists that wanted to push it further, that were not satisfied with what happened uh, in those events. Those women, uh, have been mostly led by Latinda. Uh, so I think looking to what Latinda has been doing is, uh, is a good thing. They've been working a lot on a feminist perspective on taxation. And we had a meeting in, in Buenos Aires a few months later, and we spent two days in the room just thinking, how can we engage feminist movements in general in the tax agenda? And in general, this is, this is a problem because taxation is such, it has this aura of something extremely technical, which is something that Alison was talking about before. And it is a matter for everyone. It's, it's, it's really, we need to engage people in this discussion and, uh, and this is extremely difficult. So we don't have an answer on that. Regarding racial issues, I, I think, uh, look around the room. This is an extremely white room and most spaces that we are discussing this are extremely white, I think, the movement that Africa is doing is extremely important in that sense. But in Latin America, if we look alone into research that has been done on how racism is reinforced and how race is discriminated in our tax system, there is not that much written even. So this is extremely difficult. So it's already hard to engage feminists, how to engage the black movement into this as well, or the indigenous movement into this, it's really, Difficult, so I, I I don't really have an answer, but I think this is something that we all should be thinking of on how to engage social movements in general in the tax agenda because we do need their support to actually move forward. 
Um, with respect to the first question about how Latin America can contribute to these discussions, um, Latin America is also doing incredibly good work on a regional level because they have also established their own international tax policy forum, which would allow Latin American countries and the Caribbean to consider international tax policies and how it would assist that particular region. So it's an interesting model that perhaps other developing countries could also look at in terms of how to model their regionalism. And then the question about the risk and opportunities that regionalism presents for tax advocacy. This is an interesting question because to me, the opportunities and risks are there um, and they could kind of work against each other. I say this because the opportunities I think for Africa is clear and I think many African countries see that. The idea that you could build on existing institutions, you can build on an existing willingness to work together and in so doing, bring in the increased media attention that is somehow attached to taxation. And for that, to advocate for uh, certain regional policies to be made and then agreed upon within the regions and across Africa. The risks are also very apparent. Um, it's interesting you mentioned the, in, uh, the East African community because I think that is where the risk has reached media attention. Um, so when it comes to digital service taxes, for instance, the East African community as a regional body agreed that they would institute a digital service tax in the region. And Kenya agreed to this and then a month later announced publicly that they were going to withdraw the already enacted digital service tax um, on the back of some US pressure related to a free trade area agreement. So this already indicates that there are fractures within existing regional bodies that seem to have worked well together. And the risk that comes from that media attention is of course people will start to make sweeping conclusions that things don't work because one doesn't follow. Um, and that's not necessarily true. I recently attended an ICTD conference uh, with lots of policy makers from different African regions and they were asked, why did you do this? And the answer was because we wanted to. So it's, it's difficult to try to get regional cooperation, but my idea is that if you're able to get more regional groups working together to make this process formalized, and more importantly, to advocate and indicate to the public that this is what is happening, you could have bottom up pressure to try to prevent that thing from happening. Then, if I still have time, the very last question about why it worked for Africa. I think that we should not underestimate what happened during COVID. There was unfairness to the nth degree about vaccine availability to the African continent. That made it clear that we are Africa and we are not part of the rest of the world. And I think it was fortunate for Africa that at that time, we already had a framework to work together, which was called the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. We already had a proposal to channel that Africanness into something to make a change. And I think that's what the difference is. The difference is also because of that, we were able to find more common ground that perhaps other regional communities could. ATAF has been working for a very long time to find that commonality across developing countries in Africa that are very different, but they have somehow managed to find the things that are in common and to push for that. And because they have been largely successful at the OECD, especially with the digital service tax issues, I think we've just been able to build on that momentum more effectively. Um, I'm not sure what our time is here, so I don't wanna go too long. Um, so thank you, thank you for the, definitely not doomed and absolutely has to succeed, right? Because it's critical, we, we can't go on with the system that we have. We cannot go on with the OECD, setting up a sixth forum, global forum on blah, 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 um, and inviting countries to implement policies already determined. That, that's unacceptable governance. From any perspective, that's unacceptable governance. So how can we have that conversation? Like, how do you have a conversation about what is unacceptable in governance without actually having a conversation about what is unacceptable in governance? Like, how are we having that conversation outside of the institution? So I actually, I'm, I'm agnostic about where it takes place, but how do I get it now? And I don't know, right? It's a cri de coeur in a way to say, 
where are the experts thinking about what happens if, okay, so the example that you just gave with the U.S. pushing back with the 301 investigations on the DSTs is perfect, right? Uh, what, what happens if the U.S. is involved in a conversation about governance that exposes that nothing the U.S. is doing is acceptable? Nothing the U.S. is doing in the international tax arena is acceptable from a governance perspective. The question I have, I just asked to pose you the question that I have for myself. When a country goes out to negotiate a tax treaty, for example, is it anything goes? Are there any standards for how countries deal with each other? Are there any limitations on using your trade power to exact tax concessions or put pressure? Are there any standards? Is there anything that we can say about how states should uh, deal with each other on inter interstate relations, on tax, on trade, on investment? And when we do look at the intersection of trade agreements, investment agreements, and tax, we find a disaster, a disastrous problems here, including for the OECD's own pillar two, right? We're seeing discussion rumbling in the investment arena that, well, what about all these stabilization clauses? How are you going to get around that? Uh, you can't tax us. We have these agreements that predate GLOBE. So we're, we're still talking about plumbing. We're still talking about plumbing and we should, we need to have this conversation about what is it okay to do what is it okay to use your geopolitical power to accomplish? And if there's no limit on that, then it doesn't matter where you put uh, the plumbing. It doesn't matter because the process and the interrelationship between states and how decision-making is taking place still won't be resolved. We're just pushing it down the road and it will be resolved in some other way uh, or not resolved again. And we will continue to have, I think, that grossly uh, misaligned all allocation of wealth, global wealth, that comes out of refusing to accept our own um, acceptance of a process that could lead us to the place that Rachel described that we accept the process and don't examine what limits or what standards even exist for how we talk to each other or how we set up our intergovernmental relations. So it's a critiquer, not necessarily a ideal situation. It's an anti-ideal situation, right? And how do you get out of it? I don't know. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm Lucas from the Tax Justice Network, uh, and I had a question for uh, Professor uh, uh, Afton Titus uh, because you mentioned uh, a free trade uh, agreement uh, for like uh, uh, the whole of uh, Africa, uh, and I cannot uh, uh, hold myself from thinking of like the failures of like the European uh, a single market. And how would you prevent in the African context, uh, for instance, like uh, f free riding or other issues that come uh, from like uh, having this kind of like uh, unfeathered trade uh, in a context of like uh, heterogeneous rules and uh, environmental standards or labor standards, for example? Um, thank you for your question. This is yeah. Um, that is actually very interesting. I think the first point to note is it's fortunate for Africa that it's not working in the European Union, right? Because we can immediately start to take notes and learn lessons about what not to do. So thank you for that. Um, and then next, it's just that regional economic communities have been working together for a really long time. And what we hope from that is that you have a history of finding common ground even on difficult issues. I think on an African level, it's the problem is not so much that you can find policies and decide on policies. 
it's the actual implementation of the policies that are a problem. And a lot of the implementation issues comes from outside pressure, not necessarily within a region or within a nation making a decision to do something. So the idea with the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement and why I myself am hopeful about that is because for Africa and very small countries that are in Africa, we hope that if you work together, you'd be able to withstand more rather than working on your own and then being a small country facing the big US, for example. If you have bigger regions, then you might be able to stand up to that pressure and also be able to be held accountable at home about the policies that you make um, and the impact it would have, not just you know globally, but what it means for the region. Wow, thank you. Um, what we, we have seen here is that the process matters, not only the outcomes or the results, and it matters because it refers to power, as it, it was said here, who makes the decisions and who benefits from them. And the panel has given us some recommendations that it's worth to, to remember. To decolonize the international tax reform process, to have a working group on governance, to be guided by regional process and that these regional groups work together, to reduce income, gender, and race inequalities, to ensure human rights um, so that the social contract can be for, um, strengthened and also the democracy. With that said, I would like to thank you all very much for the analysis you have made, these recommendations, the debate that the audience has also um, promoted. And this way we can end this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.